Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to our October seminar uh, for the 2022 series. And we're very pleased uh, this evening to bring to you the second of a series of, of controversial topics that we get calls on our hotline, calls on our information line, telephone calls, emails, Facebook postings. And we've accumulated some of the information that we've heard from you. And this evening, we'd like to share with you some of those thoughts. And obviously, this, this seminar webinar is open to anything from your side. But please feel free to post your questions um, as we go through on Facebook or on YouTube. My name is Francois Berman. I'm the Vice President of Safety Services at Dan. And I'll be your host this evening. <clears throat> and I'd like to introduce you to Wally Endress. He is our Sa Safety Services Coordinator. Wally is the person that helps us identify the risks that we have in the industry and works towards preventing accidents. Um, Christine is our coordinator of risk mitigation, so her primary task is to mitigate those risks. And we have Jim Gunderson, our director of uh, training. I'm sure many of you know him. And Jim heads up our first aid training programs, which um, are very popular in the industry. So as I said, please feel free to post your questions. We'll be able to see them and hopefully answer them as we go through the presentations. If you miss the opportunity, please feel free to email us at riskmitigation at dan.org. And if any of you know us, you'll know that we are pretty prompt in our replies. We enjoy hearing from you. So as I said, we have a couple of, of questions that keep coming back to us, and we thought that we'd share them um, with you on this particular uh, webinar occasion. So Wally, would you like to kick off with the first <laughs> of the questions? So uh, one, one of the common questions that we get is, is whether or not to show your highest level of certification when you get uh, onto a dive boat or signing up for a dive trip. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Jim? Yeah, there, this, this, is, this is indeed a very popular question that we get on a regular basis. Um, so let's talk about some of the history here. So we've all heard those anecdotal, anecdotal stories of a dive pro who you know, says they're a dive master or an instructor and they get on the boat and the crew wants to stick them with an inexperienced diver or that problem diver that they, the crew just doesn't want to deal with. Um, or maybe they get asked to take on some other professional responsibilities, like help with some of the boat duties, um, maybe assist in entering and exiting divers, or they're taking on that little extra student that this other instructor really doesn't want to deal with. Um, you know, and then sometimes they get asked to do other things like as, as part of a dive. Um, as, as, as a little story here, I was diving in a, at a popular wreck in, in the Caribbean, and I was asked to bring up the rear when we did the swim through of the dive of the of the wreck at the end of the dive. So they sometimes get asked to do that. Okay, so that's some of the anecdotals. They, when you, you get stuck with those inexperienced divers, you're asked to help in others some some professional capacity. But sometimes you actually get treated very well, um, and especially if you're you're there without a regular dive buddy, um, you sometimes get paired up with a with a more experienced diver. So the crew is actually taking care of you and making sure that you have a good, a good experience while you're there on vacation. Okay? Um, because they're dive professionals as well. And when they go on vacation, they don't want to be stuck in the same position as well. They want to do the dive and have a great time without any work obligations. Now also, this is a great opportunity if you do show your card and you, you start networking with other divers and potentially other instructors. So you can start building that network um, of possible referrals, or you might get a, a, a student or two out of it for yourself, or you know someone could refer one of their students to you or you to, to that other instructor that you've just met on this dive boat. But let's talk about the legal ramifications on this. So legally, opinions vary on this. When, when we were uh, doing the research on this, I asked a number of attorneys, and I said, the opinions vary. One is, Yes, you absolutely should show your highest level of certification whenever you go on a dive trip. And the underlying reason is, if something happens and a lawsuit is, is then filed and you, you're, on, you're on the witness stand and the attorneys are asking, why did you not show your highest level of certification? Why are you hiding that certification? That becomes a very, uh, could, could be a potentially problematic issue in, in a court of law, according to this one attorney. Other attorneys have said it's not necessarily an issue. Um, they, they say there's no legal ramifications for not showing your highest level card unless there's an actual emergency and you are acting in it. 
So if you act during that emergency, you've got to act to the level of care that you're qualified to provide. So you must do the, to the level of, of your ability, certifications and equipment available. So that's, those are the caveats if you don't show your, your highest level card. So what's the bottom line? Really the choice is yours. Um, but Dan recommends that you show your highest level of card. And this is especially true if the operation asks for your highest level of certification. If they just ask, are you a diver? That's one question that you could say, yes, I'm a certified diver and hand them your advanced card. Um, but if they ask, what is your highest level of certification? Then they're asking that specific question and you should indeed show that dive master or instructor card or whatever your highest level of certification card is. How do you think that uh, dive professionals can communicate to the, mm. the charter staff, the dive masters, the captain, that, that yeah. they are there just for, for uh, you know, vacation and not, not yes. working? You know, that's, that's, that's a great follow-up question. So when the, 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 where this starts is when you're checking in, whether it's at the kiosk or in the dive shop or, or, the, or at the boat, wherever, wherever you're checking in, and they're asking those questions, you know, what level of cart, what level of certification do you have? Tell them you're an instructor and that you're there on vacation. And then what you can do is when you get onto the, uh, onto the boat itself, you can, you know, find that crew member, find the captain, say, hey, I'm here. You may or may not have a dive buddy, but, you know, I'm an instructor. I'm here on vacation. And usually they take really good care of you. That's, that, that's been my experience. So just have that communication with them. You don't need to advertise, you don't, don't need to broadcast, just have that little one-on-one -on -one conversation with that crew member. Right. And if they, but remember, if they take good care of you, make sure you take good care of them. A question for you, Wally. So we all know about, in the scuba industry, we know about visual inspections, hydrostatic inspections, and so on of our cylinders. But what is the, the what is our point of view as Dan in terms of visual inspection on oxygen resuscitator cylinders? Do they fall, do they classify scuba cylinders or is there some variation in that? So let's, let's focus on the actual emergency oxygen cylinder here. Um, and, and what a lot of people uh, seem to think is that they kind of fall under the same kind of guidelines as, as scuba, that they should be visually inspected on an annual basis. Well, when it comes to oxygen, oxygen compatibility uh, and its components, um, if you're not uh, messing with it or taking it apart, um, then uh, there's, there's really no need to be, to be uh, cleaning it or visually inspecting the inside of it on an annual basis. Um, so, an inspection on a, on, a, on a frequent basis is basically goes off of use. Um, and uh, if, you're, if you're going to be uh, using it on a, on a charter boat or, or an instructor's using it during, during classes, uh, then to visually inspect the outside of the, con uh, of the cylinder itself and, and the uh, components of the oxygen kit, the emergency oxygen kit, uh, that's, it needs to be done. Uh, on a daily basis, if it's being used on a daily basis. So uh, when it comes to the actual visual inspections, um, every five years is the appropriate time to do that when the cylinder needs to go into a hydrostatic test. Uh, it would be a good idea for the hydrostatic tester to, to, to do that um, visual inspection inside and outside the cylinder. Um, and those visual inspectors really need to be somebody that's certified to do that. Uh, not not just uh, somebody looking at the kit saying, oh, well, it, it looks good. Um, we really uh, are looking at more specifically the emergency oxygen kit and not a comparison to a regular scuba bottle. Um, so uh, the picture that we have on the left here is is a cylinder and a valve that, that looks a little... A little grungy, uh, something that's been exposed to salt water quite a bit. Um, maybe the case had some some issues where where the salt air, salt water got in, and and the outside of the cylinder got a little corroded. This is a perfect situation where um, I would definitely get this thing hydrostatic tested, make sure that the inside of it looked looked decent uh, for for obvious safety reasons. 
um, the outside to be inspected too as well. Um, what we really want to uh, focus on here is with the emergency bottles is that you're not going to do an internal inspection on this thing unless you're servicing the valve, removing the valve from the bottle itself and, and looking at it. Okay, that kind of covers some of it. If I look at that picture there, um, Wally, I would suggest that that's quite, quite some um, exposure to corrosive elements, so it's not going to happen overnight. So if you do your regular inspection, your visual inspection before you go out, when you go diving, and when you come back again, make sure everything is neat and tidy and squared away. You're not likely to get that level of corrosion. So that indicates to us that's been exposed to the elements for quite a while. I, I guess also though that this will vary from region to region. So some regions might have a requirement. They're gonna consider this to be a portable cylinder. And because it falls in that classification, it does need to be uh, inspected. But having said that, um, certainly here in the US, the requirement for visual inspection is it's an industry accepted standard. The, the law says it has to be hydrostatically pressure tested every five years. And then I think if I, you can maybe comment on this, you know, really what you're saying is you have a scuba cylinder and you have an emergency oxygen cylinder. Scuba cylinders can be filled with oxygen. Yeah, they certainly can. Uh, there's several instances where 100% uh, oxygen is in a, in a scuba cylinder for those doing decompression. Um, uh, rebreather divers definitely use 100% oxygen. Um, and those cylinders in all, all matters really should follow the standard guidelines of scuba where, where those cylinders really need to be visually inspected inside and out on an annual basis. Yeah, absolutely. So one should stick with the industry guidelines with anything to do with scuba. Sure. And one, I think maybe just the last comment for you, Wally, the, or for the audience, is that a emergency oxygen cylinder will be filled with very, very dry gas. So our concern on the inside of corrosion that you'd have perhaps with a scuba cylinder is going to, going to vary. So your point is, I think, is, is a pretty good point. We yeah. do an external inspection frequently, and then we fall under the five yearly... Um, Guidelines. I think one of the things that a lot of people miss with uh, emergency oxygen kits is that they, they do the initial external inspection with the kit before they go out for their trip on a daily basis, but then they may forget that if some salt water got in the case, they're not cleaning it. Um, you know, take it out, warm water, some, some Dawn dish soap, and wipe down the bottle, wipe down the regulator, make sure that everything's nice and clean. That's going to prolong the, long, uh, the, uh, the overall condition and, and use of, of the components of it. And you won't end up with a cylinder looking like that. Absolutely. Okay. So, Christine, this is right up your alley since you're, you're our technical diving guru here. Um, so in technical diving, should a decompression cylinder be worn on the left or the right? Jim, it's a great question. It's one that we're not going to settle tonight, unfortunately. Um, but hopefully we can shed some light on some ideas behind wearing a cylinder on the left versus the right um, so that the viewers can make a decision based on their individual diving needs. Um, so the first thing I want to cover here are the three schools of thought. So the first one is that you wear a decompression cylinder on the left. The second school of thought is you wear it on the right, and then if you're using multiple cylinders, you can wear half of them on the left and half of them on the right. Um, and if someone subscribes to this third school of thought, um, the corresponding phrase is typically lean left, rich right, which basically says the cylinder with a lower oxygen content um, is the cylinder that's usually put on the left. Um, and this is the gas that will be switched to first in a decompression schedule uh, because it can bre be breathed at those deeper depths. So for the sake of argument in this question, uh, we are gonna assume a single decompression cylinder is being used by the diver. So I wanna preface this with saying, we're, this is what we're gonna talk about here, but it's also a precursor to a diver that wants to use multiple cylinders at a later time. So keep that lean left, rich right uh, in mind as we move forward. So there are a couple of things to consider here. The first one is that if you wear a decompression cylinder on the right, the long hose has an increased chance of becoming trapped. Of course, there are ways around this, but in a standard configuration, if you're wearing that decompression cylinder on the right, the long hose is probably going to be trapped in some way if you're not careful. The second thing to consider is that if you wear that cylinder on the left side, now you've got optimal hose routing coming from the first stage of that decompression cylinder around the neck and the regulator into the mouth. So that's just something to consider as well. 
Third thing here is team training. So this is all divers agreeing on what's going to be done by each individual diver in the team. So folks can do things differently, but the team needs to agree before the dive. And ideally similar practices are you know, done by each diver so that everyone is on the same page. But there's one point here that I'm gonna kind of use to hopefully settle a little bit of an argument and that is muscle memory. And that specifically is training the brain to switch to the left cylinder first, if you're using multiple cylinders. So like I said earlier, lean left, rich right. You're going to switch to a left cylinder first in a decompression schedule if you're using multiple cylinders and you decide to put half of them on the left and half of them on the right. I am specifically talking about side mount divers here. If you've dove side mount, you know you don't have a lot of real estate to work with. You can see that picture on the left of that diver carrying four cylinders. There's a lot going on here and sometimes you do have to split the cylinders between left and right. So going back to the original question, if you're using a single decompression cylinder, uh, we're gonna go ahead and suggest that you put it on the left. Train your brain. The first gas you switch to in your decompression schedule is the one on the left. Yes, we have gas switch procedures, we have verification procedures, we have tank markings. We have a lot of things in place to make sure that a diver switching to a decompression gas is doing so correctly and safely. But human factors is the big thing here. It's all the rave in the dive industry and other high-risk environments. This is just another thing that a diver can add to their toolkit to make sure that when they're switching to decompression gas, they're doing so correctly. So train that brain to switch to that gas on the left first. At the end of the day, we can suggest all day long that a decompression cylinder be worn on the left, but it is ultimately up to each individual diver. There are considerations for individual dive teams and individual divers, so uh, do whatever you need to do to make sure your diving is done safely. Um, but from a human factors perspective, it makes sense to, to put one single cylinder on the left, and that's what we're gonna go with tonight. Sounds great. And in this discussion, you were talking about a, a decompression cylinder. But we've also heard the terms decompression cylinder, decompression bottle. We've heard them sometimes referred to as stage cylinders or stage bottles. What's the difference? Well, Jim, it's great that you bring this up. Uh, conveniently, there is an article in, in quarter four of Alert Diver that is actually going to go through this entire process. Um, so I'm going to harp on three different types of cylinders. Decompression cylinders, stage cylinders, and bailout cylinders. Um, so your decompression cylinder, as the name suggests, is used for staged decompression, higher level or higher content of oxygen in those cylinders typically. Then we have stage cylinders. These are typically used by divers who are going into overhead environments to increase their penetration distance. And then bailout cylinders are typically used by our CCR divers. If they have some sort of malfunction where they need to bail out to open circuit, they've got that open circuit gas. The caveat is all of these cylinders can look exactly the same. So they can all be, say, aluminum 40s or aluminum 80s, all marked identically, um, you know, with variations on, you know, MODs, but they can all look the same, but they all have a separate purpose. And like I said, there'll be an article in Q4 to kind of go through this a little bit further and talk about why it's important to refer to them, you know, based on what they actually are. So it's more based on the purpose of the cylinder rather than the cylinder design itself. That's exactly right, Jim. Awesome. So, Francois, I actually have a question for you. And this one, um, you know, in the technical world, I get this question a bunch, um, but also we get it in the training department as well. So, most divers know there are various grades of oxygen. What's the difference? Okay, I think the question behind the question here, um, Christine, is there's a difference, but how do I go and get the gas that I need to get? How can I actually purchase the oxygen and answer the question when the gas company says to me, you know, I can or won't supply to you. So let me go through why we differentiate between the different grades and what are these grades, where do they come from, and then perhaps touch on how you can get your, your emergency oxygen cylinder filled or your rebreather cylinder filled. Okay, so we, we obviously need to use oxygen in a variety of applications when it comes to um, our scuba industry. The first, the first place, the most common place you're going to be using oxygen is when you're using partial pressure blending to make your nitrox mixture. So they'll have a cylinder of oxygen which they've got from somewhere. And what grade is that? We can come to that in a moment. Or if they are technical divers making a two mix or a tri mix, they again are going to need some form of pure oxygen. 
Then we have our rebreather re divers, mostly 100% oxygen, but it can also be um, some diluent, some other combination, maybe some helium in there. But again, what is the grade of this oxygen and how can they actually get it? And then the last of our general category that I'm going to discuss is the in-water decompression. Some people might think this is a medical treatment. It's not. As you touched on with your side mount, it's one of those gases that you're going to be using in your planned dive. Then we get on the part that is a little bit more uh, complicated to answer. And this is what, as you said, we deal with this in the training department. <clears throat> and that's when we are using emergency oxygen kits. How do we get those cylinders filled? What is the grade? And how do we go about actually purchasing that? And coupled with that, um, we have our recompression hyperbaric chambers that then obviously also use oxygen. And perhaps not quite so much in our world, but we get the question from the hyperbaric chambers, those located in really remote areas, is can I use industrial oxygen? I can't get pure oxygen. They have a concentrate on the island. We want to use pure oxygen. Can I rather use industrial oxygen? So what are the grades? What are the differences? How do you make your, your decision on that? So one of the key words in all of this is we need to be using a breathing gas. Okay, so you get other applications, we'll touch on them, but the most important part is what is fit for people to breathe, what is made for people to breathe. And as I touched on before, we have dive mixtures, that's oxygen that's used for breathing, not for treating somebody. Similarly, if you're doing in-water decompression or even surface decompression, we'll be using oxygen. And then the one that kind of sits in the gray area, and that's really why we get this question thrown at us, is your emergency oxygen kit being provided when the uh, resuscitation is provided by a lay provider, generically that falls outside of what we will call medicine. Some people will argue the point, but that's really, that's the, the um, that's how we allow to actually train people um, to be oxygen providers. Of course, if the kit is designed to be used by a medical professional, okay, so that's really important to know the difference between the lay person and the professional person, when the diver becomes a patient. So those of us lay people can't turn an injured diver into a patient, that gets done by a medical professional. And when we use oxygen for recompression in any form, because recompression is by nature a medical treatment, then we need to use medical oxygen. So I've kind of touched on the different applications you're gonna have for oxygen. So let me go really back to your question that you asked me, what is What's the difference between all these grades? And you'll hear people throw out all sorts of symbols and things. Here in the US, it comes down to the Compressed Gas Association that have a com commodity specification for oxygen, covering the entire range that we've discussed um, this evening. Um, I've taken an extract from their table, so uh, credit to them. And I'm going to take you through the different grades. There are not many that apply to us. And what I would like you to look at is the purity level of the oxygen. That's really important because you're going to see it's counterintuitive to what this discussion is all about. So CGA grade A oxygen, which is for gaseous oxygen, grade B is for liquid oxygen. We're talking about gas now. If you look at the purity level, 99%. Now, so often we get told you need to use pure oxygen. It has to be 100% oxygen. The, spe the minimum specification is actually 99%, and it's almost impossible to get 100% unless you move your decimal comma to the left-hand side. But you can see there, there's no limit on the amount of water that's allowed in there, and the purity level is 99%. We go to the next, which is CGA grade C in gaseous oxygen, and that's for industrial applications. That would be for cutting and welding and various industrial processes. They are more sensitive to contaminants in the gas than we as humans are. We can actually tolerate a lot more contaminants than you can in the welding industry where you could end up affecting the structural strength of the thing that you try to weld. So you'll see they are 99.5% minimum specification. And note, they limit the water now to a dew point of minus 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Scuba divers, that's more or less what CGA grade E air is, the air that we allow to be used in our scuba cylinders. It's the same dryness fraction. Then we get CGA grade E, and this is the one we really want to focus on for most of us sports divers. It's designed for aviators, so it's known as aviator breathing oxygen, or some folks call it AVOX. It has the same specification as industrial oxygen, but it now needs to be even drier because we have our pilots at very high altitudes, the external temperature is really cold, and we don't want that regulator to freeze up 
due to excessive moisture on the inside. And then lastly, we get our, our lab gas. It's actually um, defined as gas for semiconductor manufacturing, so clearly has to be really, really pure. And it requires an additional filtration process in the production of the gas. And you'll see there are four nines. But we've never got to 100%. So this is kind of one of those things we just have to accept the world is not perfect. And that has the driest of all specifications, of all the, the um, specifications that we've got on the, on the table. There are a couple of other grades, but they refer really to um, liquid oxygen. We're not going to be using liquid oxygen in the actual scuba industry. It all comes from liquid, but we don't use it that way. Okay, so the question then comes back to the diver. What, what can the diver get? And where can the diver actually get that? And as you can see in the table, any grade is pure enough. So we could breathe in any one of those four, um, four different grades that I have in the table over there. We just need to have a breathing gas. That then delineates between industrial and semiconductor to medical and aviator breathing gas. So we have two choices. If we are doing anything medical, you actually need a prescription from a medical doctor. So you can't just go there and say, fill my, my um, resuscitate a cylinder with medical oxygen. Dan has, um, we've got an MOU with some of the, uh, the industrial gas companies. They know what it is we're doing. They understand the oxygen is going to be provided uh, to the layperson to use, and they are prepared to fill it. They weren't certified as medical gas, but essentially they're providing us with a medical gas. And for the rest of us, aviator breathing oxygen is what we would use. So to answer your question, Christine, CGA grade E, is AVOX, aviator breathing oxygen, that is available without a prescription. It does cost a bit more, but that's the price we have to pay. So if you go to the gas company, you can say to them, please fill this with breathing oxygen, which is AVOX I guess. Um, and in, the, in essence, the difference between all those grades is the certificate that comes with the gas. So all breathing gases are analyzed. So please don't think that because we have different grades, they aren't, the quality control is not in place. And the same goes for, for the gases that we use in the industrial and the semiconductor uh, purposes. So all gases are pretty well analyzed. So at the end of the day, if you're stuck, you can try your luck with the gas company. Some of them, as I say, if it's an emergency resuscitator, will follow the Dan MOU. They've very graciously allowed us to motivate the case to them. And if that doesn't work, then go to your local um, dive shop that does mix mixtures for you. And, they will probably have aviator breathing oxygen because they are generally selling that for non-medical applications and they would be filling the rebreather cylinders, um, the various trimixes and everything else and they can fill your resuscitator cylinder. So I know it's a, it's a technical topic, it's a relatively simple answer, CGA grade E oxygen, not to be confused with CGA grade E air for our scuba cylinders, um, and that is available without any limitations. Well, I think you answered that brilliantly, um, and I think at this point we can maybe turn to Facebook, YouTube, see what else we've got. Um, okay, so, so you don't want me to say any more. I'm the, I'm the I, know, I think you nailed it. <laughs> 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 Candidly, I think that was an awesome, uh, awesome response there, Francois. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of the in-house engineer, so you'll have to pardon me when I elaborate a lot about the technical <laughs> stuff. But as you can hear, I'm very passionate about. Uh, about these topics. And uh, maybe just to, to finish off with Christine, we're actually going to be publishing an article in Alex Alert Diver on some of this information. And the reason we are bringing these things to our audience is because these are questions that we get asked. And as you can hear us kind of trying to explain, the answer is not always that easy to, to come up with. So that's just the industry we're in. You know, they don't write all the rules for, for scuba divers. We have some rules, but in general, we need to kind of find our way through uh, through the industry. Absolutely. So what do you folks want to ask us out there? Anything, I don't see anything coming up yet, but um, we might be, we're normally um, delayed a little bit, so there's a, a lag between when we're talking and what you are actually hearing. So perhaps none of the questions have come up yet or, or the system is on, uh, on free. So maybe, Christine, what else do we, what else do we get asked? Well, I think another question that we get asked, and it's kind of a hot topic in the industry in general right now. I've heard a couple of people talk about it and debate it, and it all revolves around tipping. You know, now that the world is back open, people are traveling again, um, tipping comes up quite often. And maybe this is a question for Wally. Um, what's proper tipping etiquette? I'm sure this isn't a simple answer, but it might be th something oh. that our viewers want to know about. 
This, this is definitely not a simple answer. Um, and I think what this really kind of boils down to is the region in which you're, which you're diving, um, whether it's the United States or, or abroad. Um, it really, it really kind of depends on what the customs are in that area. Um, there's quite a few areas uh, that, that just kind of frown upon tipping. They, they, uh, they claim to say that they pay their staff a fair wage and there's really no need to do that. And, and it's, it's looked differently in the United States. Um, in most cases, the, uh, the United States kind of treats tipping in terms of, you know, it's either really good service, really poor service, whether it's uh, you're tipping based on how many tanks your, your dive is. If it's a two tank dive, you're, you know, $10 per tank, $5 uh, for each tank. It, it really varies. But what this really boils down to is, is um, uh, what region you're in, what the customs are. Um, and if you're unsure of that, it's, it's a really good idea to, to ask whether it's the, the boat captain or the dive operator uh, to say what, what that, that is. Maybe just to ask another person that, that is familiar with the area to say, hey, what do you normally do in this situation? Um, and uh, you'll probably get a pretty honest answer as to, as to what it is. Um, the last time I personally asked that answer or asked that question, the answer was, do, if you feel that the service was really good, um, then you know, throw in the tip as what you think is a fair thing. If you don't think it was a good service, then adjust accordingly. So I guess the part of the answer is to err on the side of being generous. In other words, acknowledge if you've had a good dive, and even if tipping isn't done, then. Rather err on the side of being generous than, than just assuming. So I know in some countries they say don't tip. Um, we're not quite sure why. Here in the US we're pretty much used to rewarding good service. So from my point of view, I always, as you say, while you ask, yeah. and rather err on the side of, of being generous. You, you get a pretty good response usually from that. Well, a lot of people don't really understand what the term tips means. And it if you really kind of... Uh, understand that is is tips means to ensure prompt service <laughs> so uh, it's it's not a it's not a reactive <laughs> thing it's a it should be a proactive thing um, so yeah uh, when people realize that then uh, you know if they really are getting good service from their experience then you know it's it's a, a, a sign of gratitude yeah okay. Christine I see there's a question there I'm not sure whether you covered it in your um your talk on the, on the cylinders, which side to put on where, but I see this gentleman down here talks about leaving your eco cylinders pretty much at the, at the entrance to the cave. Is yeah, cave diving is a little bit unique, right? So we're specifically talking about open circuit technical diving in an, a non-overhead environment for this, the purposes of you know, our controversial topic tonight because you're always going to be carrying that cylinder with you um, if you're in, in open water there. So cave diving, yeah, most cave divers leave their decompression cylinders at 20 feet, retrieve them on the exit. Um, at that point, again, this all comes back to individual diver needs, individual dive needs. Um, we're simply pointing out some of the pros and cons of wearing it on the left, wearing it on the right. To keep coming back to the human factors um, you know it's a simple thing to do um, and it makes sense when you look at a couple of other components but at the end of the day um, to wear it on the right may it's not necessarily wrong we're not the scuba police yeah. um, but it's for each individual diver so that's just things to consider here as long as you're trained and uh, you know what you're doing that's really mm -hmm. the key it seems to me that the communication between your dive team is really, really key in that. Absolutely, I think that's kind of always what it comes back to. What are the individual divers comfortable with? What are the team goals and what are the team, you know, what's the communication there? So yeah, you're spot on, Jim. Okay, what else, uh, what are the other questions? We, we, we kind of, between the four of us, we're always handling these difficult questions mm -hmm. and sometimes we come and share with each other and sometimes we just kind of, you know, have to go and pick up the books and have a look. We certainly don't know everything there is uh, to know about it. And we, we're really sharing with you what we hear from the industry and what, what is good practice, what is sound practice. Ultimately, we're about safe practice. So what else do we have that we can share with our audience? So there's another question that comes up from time to time is that cylinder that's sitting in, in your garage for six months, a year, year and a half, can I take that and go dive with it 
Or do I need to drain it and have it refilled and, or inspected and then refilled? How, do, how is that handled? Why do you ask me the difficult questions? <laughs> <laughs> this one evokes a lot of response, and I'm sure in the audience there'll be a couple of people that are going to want to shoot me down at the end of this. But let me give you the, the polite version of it first. So we have, as Wally mentioned, a requirement for visual inspection mm -hmm. every year. That applies when you refill the cylinder. So if a cylinder's been standing there for 10 years, um, theoretically, in accordance with safe practice, annual inspection, five-yearly hydrostatic inspection, it doesn't apply. It only applies when you refill the cylinder. Prudence would dictate perhaps otherwise because many things could have happened while that cylinder was um, being stored. It could have been taken, used, and refilled, and you just weren't aware of that. But from the science point of view, Jim, I mean, this is the part that the chemists like to argue sometimes for and sometimes against. And I've read a couple of articles on this particular issue. Hey, remember the gases we breathe have been around for a lot longer than we have been. So the gases themselves aren't the problem. The, the question comes up, if the gas was very wet, if it went into the cylinder, you've obviously got moisture in the cylinder, which is going to cause some degree of corrosion. Some people will, will tell us straight out, if they've heard or they've read, that after one year, the gas inside the cylinder, the air, is now hypoxic. It's actually, the oxygen has been consumed by the steel to form rust or corrosion, and the next thing you know, after one year, it's going to be at 17%. Well, we've spoken to some of the chemists, and it's not kind of quite that dramatic. It'll take a long time. And we know that because at hyperbaric chambers that have compressed gas, and I've just been to a chamber now down in a Little Cayman. They've been offline since before COVID struck, so here's a straight answer for you. I was down there doing a an assessment. I analyzed the gas in the high-pressure cylinders. They were last filled in 2018. The oxygen percentage is 20.9%. It's good, it's dry air, so there's no reason. So, Jim, to answer your question, it's quite simple. If you've had control on it, I wouldn't have an issue. Perfect. If you've lost control of it, probably discussion. $15 refill. Yeah. Looks like there's a couple questions that came in on YouTube. You can take a look at those. Right there. So the question is, what are the panel's views on self-reliant and solo diving? My gosh. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, here we go. Christine, do you want to take a first shot at this I'll one? I'll take a first crack at this I, one. I think Wally's well, got an opinion, I've got one on it as well. So we'll... I, I think this comes down to quite a few things, and I want to stay super general here. So there are solo and self-reliant classes. Uh, there's also something to be said about building a bank of experience, so going Absolutely. a dive after dive after dive, getting those little nuggets of information. I like to say storing them in your bank because when something goes wrong, you're going to need to make a major withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, there are classes available. Um, I encourage folks, even if you're not interested in diving by yourself, take a class. Um, you're gonna learn a lot from the instructor. You're gonna learn a lot of new skills that you may not have even thought about um, in your diving. Um, but at the end of the day, I always kind of tend to think about what is something that you can't have two of on a dive. You can always have two cylinders, you can have two cutting devices, you can't have two brains. That's the biggest piece mm -hmm. of solo diving. And that's not to say don't solo dive or definitely solo dive. It's something to think about. So it's just you. Um, so if something does go wrong, it falls on your shoulders to solve whatever problem. And if that's a level of risk that you can manage and handle and your training corresponds with whatever it is that you want to do task-wise, there's training available. That's, that's kind of my opinion. I think the, the really... Uh, really important part to look at when it comes to solo diving self-reliant training is the fact that you are learning skills to cope with potential issues um, it, it's not the yeah, at the end of the day it's not about going out diving by yourself because you feel like diving by yourself um, it, it's about mitigating those risks mm -hmm. uh, it's about learning skills that will will help you uh, manage those problems as they come up, whether it's a, a, a mask strap failure or, or uh, you know, some, some sort of failure with, with any piece of your equipment. It's, it's really about learning those skills and, and adding that skill set to your, your uh, uh, having your ammunition, really. Um, so, I mean, 
Personally, I love the, the, the concept of uh, self-reliant courses and the solo courses because I, I think it really does uh, add quite a bit of background and skill set to the average diver. Um, but we're also talking apples and oranges here when we go mm -hmm. to the uh, standard open water recreational diver versus, uh, you know, the instructor uh, versus technical divers. Uh, we could we could be here for hours talking right. about this it's, topic. Oh, this it's is really true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to add just kind of echo, but add a couple of things here as well. So with obviously Dan wants to promote that buddy sport. So we have you have that redundancy with another person. You you brought that up with the brain, and that's I think that's that's a great aspect. And and every training agency also recommends that as well. But there are a number of training agencies that that do offer the self reliant course. And I think when we when you're considering that self reliant course, what experience do you have? How many dives do you have? What 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 experience do you have going into that course? I think you need to have a, a, a really good basis of solid diving knowledge before you even consider that self-reliant course. And make sure, if you, if you decide to go that route of self-reliant or solo diving, make sure you get trained in those techniques and you have the necessary equipment. That's, I think that's the bottom line. The other thing I just thought of as you were talking is I have a lot of friends in the industry who have simply taken a self-reliant or a solo course to become a better buddy. Um, mm, so learning yeah. those skills for yourself, which immediately mm -hmm. translate into the team dynamic of mm -hmm. diving, which again is what Dan likes to promote. Um, I, I'm a huge advocate for if there's training available and an instructor you want to learn from, find that person and learn as much as you can from them, whether that be in a solo course or, or another course um, that isn't all about the solo diving. So like Wally said, we could be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of sitting all night, I see that Sherry has a question for us over there. And that speaks to your, your part of your presentation or your answer to that question, uh, Christine, is how much diving do you need to establish uh, good muscle memory? I think we could be here all night with that one as well. <laughs> and I think that is a really independent question. It is solely based on the diver's experience, attitude, goals. I mean, there are so many factors that could play into answering this question. Um, and really, it's going to be up to each individual diver to figure out for themselves when does something become second nature? When can I shut my brain off and do something without thinking? Um, so I wish I had a, a solid numerical answer and it just goes back to gain as much experience as you can, make those deposits into your bank of experience because when things go south, you're gonna have to make a withdrawal. I had a ski coach in college that said, do a turn a thousand times in a row right and it's yours. I have yet to make a thousand correct turns in a row. I have yet to make a thousand correct mass clears in a row. So what is that muscle memory? That's, I think it's going to be very individualized, but you're right. Repetition, repetition, practice, practice, practice. It's going to be an instinctive. I mean, you're not always yeah. going to get it right. I see we have a couple of medical questions there. So the question about type 2 diabetes and asthma with diving, please reach out to us. You can either get us at medicadan.org or send it to risk mitigation. We'll forward that to our medical department because yeah. we're not really, we're not the the clever people to answer those questions. Um, there was one more question about balloon grade helium, and you know, I always mm. chuckle when people tell me this. So I guess if, if some enterprising person buys helium and then refills other people's helium grade cylinders, you're gonna lose some control of the, of the quality there. But let me assure you that helium is very expensive and they don't make dirty helium. So the only way to get dirty helium is you need to bleed out the cylinder and have somebody else charge it for you and whatever else was inside there is going to be the contaminant. It doesn't work that way. The companies that fill it, now remember that's not breathing grade helium necessarily, but here's the caveat, there is a CGA grade, a CGA specification, commodity specification for helium, and there is a grade of helium that is breathing grade. So it is possible to get it. What they use for the balloon, I don't know what grade they bought, probably the cheapest. But if you want to get helium, there is breathing grade helium. A lot of people don't actually know that. So what else do we have? Anything else from any of you folks out there? I don't see anything that's, um, that's going to kind of stump us or make us <laughs> be here all, all night. So last, last uh, chance, anybody here amongst us that uh, want to share something else that we, some of, the other, some of them we can't share because <laughs> they're just really difficult. But um, I think we've covered yep. in the last two presentations some of the really tricky ones. Mm -hmm. 
think the biggest thing is if folks do have questions, reach out to us. Reach That's out. why we're here. So you can either, you know, call us on the phone and we would be more than happy to talk to you um, or shoot us an email at riskmitigation at dan.org. And uh, if we don't know the answer, we will certainly research it until we find one for you. And if we do know the answer, you're going to get a lengthy response that hopefully uh, clears things up for you. We that's, love answering that's those. That's why we're here. We, yep. we really, as Absolutely. you can hear, we really enjoy these, yeah. these debates. And we have them frequently. And it gets quite heated from time to time. <laughs> Somebody has to make the final decision, right? OK, well, I don't see anything else new that's popped up. So I would like to thank you all for being with us and sharing this, this particular evening with us. Um, we really need to thank our members because without them, we couldn't be here. They support us. Um, the income we get from them is what really funds the Dan mission, um, which we believe we're passionate about preventing people from having accidents out there in the industry. That's what we're about, prevention. That's what safety service is all about. Um, you can obviously, afterwards, you can watch the presentations either on our um, normal website, dan.org, or you can see it on Facebook, it'll remain there, as well as Dan's, Dan's YouTube channel, which is probably the best place really to you know, get a really good quality reproduction of the presentation. And I'd like to finish off by saying, um, or by putting the question out to you, the things that confuse you, the things that you have debates uh, about between your your co-workers, your co-divers, if it's in a dive shop, if it's a bunch of dive instructors, if it's just the recreational divers, Haven rebreather divers becoming more and more popular. Send us the questions. That's you know what we really are here to, to answer. And then maybe if there are enough questions, we'll have uh, controversial issues part three. So thank you very much for being with us and uh, good evening.